is recorded for all posterity. All right, let's see. So what we're going to talk, no, that's not the right PowerPoint. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about something else. There we go. Synapses and neurotransmitters. Get the pen started. Ah, come on. Want to get writing? No. Shh. I hate this thing. Now that's going to be recorded for all posterity. All right. Um... All right, now it's, I gotta get the pen again, dadgummit. There we go. All right, so synapses and neurotransmitters. The first part of this will be uh, very much review of what we've already done uh, in the muscle uh, in unit three. You guys should know about synapses is basically the, the junction of the axon terminals of one neuron and whatever effector, whatever organ, whatever neuron, whatever it's gonna uh, elicit a response from. So it's just the junction. From one neuron, it could be to another neuron, it could be a muscle, it could be a gland, it could be an organ, like the heart, uh, it could be the pancreas, it could be the stomach, just whatever organ it's going out to. So that's wherever an, an, an axon terminal transfers information to something else, that's the synapse. So obviously you have a presynaptic side and a postsynaptic side. So if we go back to our figure that we did over and over and over again in the muscles, Here's the axon terminal, here's the muscle, this would be the presynapse, and this would be the postsynapse. Um, this is, uh, I think this is a cool picture. This is an electron micrograph of a real, a real synapse, and you can see here's the axon, here's the axon terminals coming down onto the, uh, the postsynaptic uh, structure. Now, don't get the idea that it always has to, that a neuron always has to go to an organ. Remember, some in the brain, spinal cord, things like that, other neurons will synapse on other neurons. That's how your brain works. So that's how you uh, transmit information up and down the spinal cord and inside the brain is you have axon synapses synapsing on cell bodies uh, of other neurons. Now, have you already been in lab? We talked about the Hershey Kisses. Uh, sometimes an axon terminal will uh, synapse on a dendrite, and sometimes an axon terminal will synapse on the cell body. If an axon uh, synapses on, a, on the actual cell body, it's called axosomatic. If an axon um, synapses on a dendrite, they're axodendritic. So if I use the terms axosomatic or axodendritic, I'm just explaining to you where on the cell body or the dendrite the axons are synapsing. So like I said, I may forget to explain that, so if I use those terms, you know what I'm talking about. All right, now we've talked about chemical synapses. That's pretty much all we've talked about up until this point where you have basically the release of a neurotransmitter. And the one that we've talked about repeatedly was acetylcholine. There are synapses that are electrical. They're not very common. Um, basically, instead of having that gap, that space like we do in a chemical synapse, they actually are joined. Okay, they're joined by a gap junction, so they're actually in contact with each other. And that action potential actually does just transfer from one cell to another, okay? Um, it's a really, really fast way of communication. You don't have that delay of having the acetylcholine being released, diffusing across the membrane. Even though that's fast, this is even faster, all right? You'll see them sometimes in some brain regions, and I'm, I'm not going to make you remember where that is, but you also see it in embryonic tissue. Um, and I just think this is kind of cool because I always ask, why do you think you would see this in embryonic tissue? Why would you expect it to be there, an electrical synapse instead of a chemical synapse? But that, you're, 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 they're not ready yet. There, there's not enough material there to even start making proteins and making vesicles and making neurotransmitters. They just don't have all their stuff yet, so they're not developed. Uh, they're really small, small uh, organisms at this point. When you have a, a single cell fertilized, it's going to divide into two, uh, two cells, then four cells, and eight cells, and 16, until it finally looks like a little chicken. It looks like a, you know, a, a <laughs> looks like something. But for a while, it's just kind of a blob of cells. And so basically, you have uh, there's got to be communication between these cells. And so it's a really quick and effective way until you have development and you actually have pathways for neurotransmitters. So you'll see it in uh, early embryonic tissue.
and then, and like I said, some brain tissues, and we'll talk about that later on. Chemical synapses is what we're really familiar with. They're very, very common. Uh, this is where you're going to have the release of a neurotransmitter. So, for example, acetylcholine. It could be dopamine. It could be epinephrine. It could be um, serotonin, melatonin. All kind of neurotransmitters are released uh, by chemical synapses. They're going to be the um, these chemical synapses always have a pre and a post, just like what we've talked about in the muscles, the neuromuscular junction. Same exact idea. You have the presynaptic axon terminal, and then the postsynaptic whatever, either another neuron, muscle, organ, whatever. And we're going to talk about probably about 15 or 20 different types of neurotransmitters and what they do. When we talk about that synaptic cleft, remember it's just a space between the pre and postsynaptic neurons. Um, there's a little bit of fluid filling that space so that the neurotransmitters can diffuse across that cleft. Um, it's a chemical event. You've actually got to have a release of a neurotransmitter. It's got to diffuse across, a, uh, diffuse across that uh, cleft and then bind. And then once you get binding on the other side, something's going to happen. Usually the generation of active potential, but not always. And we'll talk about uh, several different things that happen on the postsynaptic side. Sometimes it's action potential, sometimes it's completely different, but we'll get there. Um, let me go ahead and this is click to this picture. This is, this is this picture written out in big print in case you couldn't read it on your slides. I just wrote it out big for you in case if you printed it out you couldn't see it. Again, I expect you guys to know this. So this is something that we've already done a bazillion times. I've said it in my sleep and hopefully you can too. But you still got to know what's going on. So just as review, one more time, when you get that action potential coming down an axon, right, that's basically electrical current. It's going to change the membrane potential and change the voltage of that membrane at the axon terminal. That's going to open voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium's going to enter. Calcium's going to uh, cause these uh, vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter to exocytose their contents out, in this case acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is going to cross the uh, synaptic cleft, bind to its receptor. These receptors are ligand gated, which means they bind the channel and then open up the channel, cause movement of ions, generation of an action potential, and that's the same thing that happens in the muscle. We talked about it, talked about it, talked about it. Um, that was the bonus. Uh, a lot part of that was the bonus on the uh, on the exam, and several people still missed it, even though I've gone over it and over it and over it and over it. So, you know, we just we're gonna have to memorize this. <laughs> You're gonna see it again. Just seeing if you're paying attention. We talked about that. Um, now, just like acetylcholine, you've got to get rid of those neurotransmitters. You've got to stop whatever action that you're trying to elicit. So you can either uh, have the neurotransmitter uh, broken down, like acetylcholinesterase. There's something esterases for other neurotransmitters that break them down by enzymes. Um, they may diffuse away, just like acetylcholine. They just basically float away. Sometimes the neurotransmitters are basically taken back up, reuptake by those astrocytes. Remember those uh, support cells, those duroglial cells? They'll actually take up the, um, the neurotransmitter as is, take it back up into the exon terminal to recycle it. So one of those three ways, or all three of those ways, you're going to get rid of that neurotransmitter so that you can you know, stop the effect. Now. Um, Neurotransmitters can be uh, excitatory or inhibitory, okay? We didn't really talk about that on the, uh, on the muscle. When you have an axon terminal, a lot of axons actually contain more than one type of neurotransmitter, okay? So let's just, uh, we're going to use an imaginary one right now, okay? We're going to have neurotransmitter A and neurotransmitter B. Let's say A is excitatory and B is inhibitory. All right? So you got a signal coming down. 
causes A to be released. If A comes across, it's excitatory and it elicits some kind of a response. So you get something happen. If B is released, it basically blocks this side and you get no response. So you've got both of these, uh, both of these possibilities. You can either excite the, the, set, the other membrane or you can uh, inhibit it. So you have excitatory uh, responses and inhibitory. So let me kind of show you a picture. Let me give you, okay. So here's that minus 70. <laughs> All right, that's basically our membrane potential. That's where it's going to hang out. Sometimes you will send a signal that doesn't actually cause a response, but it starts to bring the threshold up. Okay, it starts to bring that membrane potential up so that it's a little closer to threshold, so it doesn't take quite as much to excite it. That's an excitatory potential. So sometimes you'll release a neurotransmitter that won't actually cause a response. It'll just kind of cause that membrane potential to start becoming more positive so that it's more likely to fire the next time, okay? So that you're, you're exciting it. You're getting it ready to go. Sometimes you'll uh, send out a stimulus that's inhibitory. It will actually lower, make the, the membrane potential become more negative, go away from threshold, so it's even harder to cause a response. So you're basically setting it up for failure. You won't let it go. So you may send out a signal. It's not enough to cause anything to happen, but it's just enough to get it ready and get it excited or to totally inhibit it. And we're going to talk about alcohol and how alcohol works. Uh, and that's one of the, it works uh, in a fashion similar to this. It basically slows down your response time. It inhibits your ability to move. You think you're doing, you know, really good and dancing cool, but you're, but you're really not. Okay, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about that. If you haven't done, if you haven't done mouse party yet, uh, make sure that you do that. And we're going to do it in class. We'll either do it in class or lab. I want you guys to play the mouse party and, and and see how some of this works. But we'll we'll if we can't get to it today, we'll get to it next week or in lab. But that's gonna that's how some of these neurotransmitters work. They actually inhibit the ability of, of your other neuro, neurotransmitters to work. All right, uh, so th this is an example where you've got, you know, several stimuli. They're not enough to cause a response. But you'll notice if you have one excitatory uh, kind of gets it primed to go, and then a second one comes really, really close to it, it'll fly up there and uh, be ready to go. So that's that summation. We have the same thing in the muscles, where if you give a response really fast, You'll get that summation of response. That was trippy for all of you guys that missed that. Uh, so you can actually sum, sum up, uh, make a response occur even larger if you'll stimulate it really quickly. Um, let's see. On this one, just a uh, graphic. Here you've got an excitatory. You get a really nice response. If you hit it with an inhibitory one first, you've already lowered it. Regardless of what you do, it won't go. So you can actually stop something. And like I said, this is we're going to talk about this when we talk about alcohol. So you'll see it again. So just hang with me. All right. Um, let's talk about the different types of neurotransmitters. Uh, there's at least 50 or more that have been identified. Um, most neurons make at least two. Uh, they're, some are inhibitory, some are stimulatory. But they're all classified by what they look like, their chemical structure, and by what they do. Are they excitatory? Are they inhibitory? Things like that. So we're going to go through, I think, about 15 of them. I'm not going to make you learn 50 neurotransmitters. We're just going to talk about some of the common ones. And we're going to talk about some of the common ones that we tend to associate with um, uh, mood, uh, things like anxiety, depression, things like that. The ones that you commonly hear about, you've heard of MAOIs and SRI. You've heard these little terms when, talk, when the when the commercial comes on TV and talks about taking Prozac or Lexapro or whatever sleep aid that you're talking about, it usually has some disclaimer at the end. And so hopefully we're going to talk about that today and you'll understand what those disclaimers actually. Yeah, you know, I like, there was, there was a, yeah, then it's like, you'd feel worse. The, the, the disclaimers usually sound like you'd feel worse than actually taking the medicine. But we're going to talk about what some of those actually are. We already know this one, acetylcholine. Okay, that's the one released at the neuromuscular junction. That's what stimulates the skeletal muscle. There are some autonomic neurons that also use it. Um, that's kind of a secondary use, but the one I want you to focus on is neuromuscular junction. 
Uh, it is made inside the uh, axon terminal by an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase. So let's look at that word, acetyl, choline acetyltransferase. That tells me that this transferase puts the acetyl on the choline <laughs> and makes acetylcholine. Then you have acetylcholinesterase that breaks it down. So one enzyme makes it and one enzyme breaks it down. And that's very similar in just about every neuron, uh, neurotransmitter. There's some similar type of a um, enzyme cascade. It's action, voluntary muscle movement. Now we have some that are called the amines. And they're going to have the last, uh, the prefix amine. There's catecholamines and endolamines. Your main catecholamines are dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. You may have seen uh, the word noradrenaline or adrenaline. Noradrenaline and norepinephrine are the same thing. Epinephrine and adrenaline are the same thing. So you may see those um, used interchangeably. We usually use norepinephrine and epinephrine in uh, anatomy and physiology. So norepinephrine, uh, okay, go back to dopamine. Dopamine, it's uh, kind of a feel-good uh, neurotransmitter. When it's released inside your brain, it tends to make you feel better, it tends to arouse your emotions, make you feel happy. Uh, norepinephrine tends to increase your wakefulness. So if you have a, you know, something that will increase the amount of norepinephrine you're producing, you tend to be kind of uh, more awake. Epinephrine tends to increase your uh, heart rate and blood pressure. You'll hear, uh, you've probably heard, probably heard of an adrenaline rush. So if you've ever, you know, done something like the, the whole, uh, you're, you know, you're being chased by a dog, okay, and you're trying to get away. And so you have an adrenaline rush to basically increase your heart rate, increase your respiration rate, increase your blood pressure, and allow you to get away faster. So that's what epinephrine is doing. Uh, endolamines, the two main examples of endolamines are serotonin and his, whoops, histamine. Uh, serotonin has to do with uh, memory, uh, wakefulness, and also helps you regulate your temperature. So if you, know, if you have a serotonin imbalance, you may have trouble regulating your temperature, may be hot or cold all the time. Histamine <coughs> uh, helps keep you uh, awake. It's also uh, released uh, during signs of inflammation. All right, so during this time of the year, we've all got itchy, watery eyes. What, are we, what medicine are we taking? An antihistamine, okay, because you're trying to lower that, in, oh, dad, get on it. lower that inflammation. You know, you're trying to reduce that histamine being released, so reduce that inflammation. If you take an antihistamine, it makes you what? Sleepy. <laughs> so that's, you know, you, your kid, you're going on an eight-hour drive, you want them to sleep, what do you do? You give them a... <laughs> Give them a Benadryl, <laughs> an antihistamine. So you, you've heard of these terms and you know what they do, you just didn't realize it, okay? So we're going to try to make you realize that you, you know more than you thought you did, okay? All right, you have uh, some amino acids that actually work as, amino, as uh, neurotransmitters. GABA, why did I lose my pen? Let me put it back. There we go. GABA which is gamma amino butyric acid. I'm not going to make you remember that, okay? Just remember GABA. Uh, it inhibits. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's enhanced by alcohol. Okay, so if you drink alcohol, what that does is it causes you to produce or release more GABA, okay? If you release more GABA, that's going to inhibit your motor neurons. That's why you don't want to drunk drive. You're driving down the road. You think you're at full speed ahead and you know what you're doing. What's happening is GABA is now being totally released everywhere, slowing down the efficiency of your motor neurons so your response times are really slow. So that's what's happening. The alcohol is, it's not the alcohol that's doing anything to you. I mean, you're, you're not reacting to the alcohol per se. You're reacting to its effect on GABA. Does that make sense? All right. You have another amino acid called glycine, and uh, it plays a role in reflexes. And you, if you, uh, you'll see the video on reflexes by Ms. Graham and uh, hear a little bit more about that. You have some peptides. Peptides are basically proteins, some neuropeptides. One's called substance P. I think P stands for peptide, actually. And it's, uh, 
uh, a neurotransmitter that uh, is re released in response to pain. And you have endorphins. You ever heard of like a runner's high? Okay, these are natural opiates. Uh, so your body releases these endorphins. They act as an opiate. They don't make you feel better. They reduce your perception of pain. Does that make, does that, does that make more sense? So it's not making you feel better. It's just you don't feel the pain anymore. You know, you're numb. You're comfortably numb. You know the song. So that's kind of what's going on. All right, so it's reducing your idea that you're actually in pain. So it's kind of masking, masking it. You have uh, th uh, purines, examples ATP. Uh, it's usually uh, released in response to pain. It works in both the central and peripheral nervous system. And there are even some gases that act as neurotransmitters. And this is always kind of uh, throws people off that there's actually some neurotransmitters that are gases. The main one that you'll hear about uh, in, uh, in 202 is nitric oxide. And nitric oxide acts as a vasodilator, all right? We see it uh, in learning and memory, but the one that you're going to hear about it again, it is a neurotransmitter that leads to erection. So basically nitric oxide is released uh, in the area of the penis, causes the uh, area to vasodilate, and so blood engorges the penis and you get an erection. So that is due to nitric oxide. What? During arousal. Yeah, so that's so it leads to erection. Yeah, so when you're aroused, nitric oxide is released. That leads to blood going into the penis, causing it to, causing it to be engorged. Same thing with the clitoris. Causes it to be engorged, and you get an erection. And that's how that occurs, and it's actually a gas. You love it. <laughs> to... I was waiting for a response. I knew it was coming. Knew it was coming. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, basically how you classify them on their structure or their chemical, <laughs> their chemical composition. Uh, then you can uh, classify them, are they excitatory? Obviously nitric oxide is. <laughs> or inhibitory. If it's excitatory, it tends to depolarize the membrane, causing it to be more likely to fire. If it's inhibitory, it hyperpolarizes the membrane, causing it less likely to fire. Um, you can... Uh, it is somewhere about that. GABA, what I want you to know, GABA and glycine are usually inhibitory. They're typically our main inhibitory neurotransmitters. Uh, glutamate is usually excitatory. Acetylcholine can be both. On neuromuscular junctions, it's excitatory. So in skeletal muscle. On cardiac muscle, which also releases acetylcholine, or the neurons in, in cardiac muscle, it's inhibitory. All right, so when, we, when you're talking about drug classifications, you guys are going to maybe have pharmacology one day. Uh, when you're thinking about uh, things like uh, beta blockers and things like that, a lot of times what they're doing is they're increasing the effect or decreasing the effect of the neurotransmitters that you already have. Again, we'll, we'll talk about this more uh, when we do the, ma the mouse party. It's just a really good way to see how that's working. So, But just remember, GABA and glycine are your main inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters, glutamate is always excitatory, I should say always, and then acetylcholine can be both. Um, the way neurotransmitters work, um, they can work in one of two ways. They can work directly or they can work indirectly. And I'm going to just kind of touch on the indirect method of how they work. When you're in 202, you're going to talk about hormones, and you're going to talk about steroid hormones. You're going to talk about different kind of hormones with second messenger systems, and you will see this again, but I want to introduce the topic to you now so that maybe you have a little bit of idea about that when you get to 202. If it's a direct action, that means it binds to a channel or a receptor and actually causes something to happen, just like we've talked about. Here's the axon. All right, here's that ligand-gated channel on the muscle, acetylcholine binds, something happens. That's just direct action, okay? We've seen that over and over again. Amino acids do the same thing if they're neurotransmitters. They're very, very fast. Goes across, binds, causes a response. If it's indirect, that means the neurotransmitter 
crosses the uh, synaptic cleft, and it binds a basically G protein. All right, and nothing actually happens at that point. This G protein is bound, but then that begins a cascade or a series of events. It sets in motion a cascade of events. Then you get a response. So it's a little bit slower, but these tend to last a long time. They're long lasting effects like nitric oxide. Erections can last, you know, depending <laughs> two minutes or, you know, four hours, and then you got a problem if you're taking a, um, a Viagra. Viagra or Cialis. <laughs> so uh, these are things that tend to be long acting. Uh, they tend to be uh, neuropeptides and amines. So I think I've got a picture. Let me just, uh, do, do, do. I, Okay, so here's a direct. Uh, here's direct. Here's the. This is. This is this the acetylcholine or the neurotransmitter. It binds, causes a response. All right. I'm going to go to the picture. I wrote all that out for you in case you couldn't read it on the picture, but here's the actual picture. So what's happening in a in, in an indirect? This is just an example of how this would work. Here's your neurotransmitter. It binds the G protein, okay? This is the G protein uh, receptor. This causes a cascade, all right, where GDP is kind of like ADP. Instead of adenosine triphosphate, it's guanine <coughs> triphosphate. This GDP undergoes a series of reactions where it then binds another protein. See that word ACE? That ACE means it's an enzyme. And I'm not asking to memorize the steps of how this works, okay? You're going you're gonna to do that in 202. I just want you to see it so you can understand why this is slower than a direct action. So indirect slower because you've got to have this cascade of, of events happening. This adenylate cyclase then will cleave ATP into uh, cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is actually the second messenger, okay? So your first messenger was the actual neurotransmitter. You get the formation of cyclic AMP, which is your second messenger, and it's what actually causes something to happen. The cyclic AMP then either works on an enzyme, it may open up a channel in the membrane, it may go to the nucleus and cause activation of genes, it may cause proteins to be made. Something's going to happen, and it can be several different possibilities. But this takes a while. So this tends to be long acting. The reason it's long acting is if you tend to open up, if you tend to inc um, stimulate protein production in the nucleus, okay, it's going to take a while to make those proteins, have them bundled, have them packaged, have them sent out, and those proteins aren't going to be immediately degraded. They're going to act for a long time. So these tend to be slow-acting uh, processes. Uh, like, again, I, I'm not asking you to go back and, and, and uh, memorize any of this. I just want you to understand why it's slow, because you've got to get this cascade into motion. You will see it again in 202, and, and, um, and you'll understand it a lot better then. If you want to learn more about it, by all means, come ask me. My entire PhD was spent working on second messenger systems, so I know just a little bit about it. But, so if you want to know more, come see me. All right. So uh, let's talk about some of those drugs that maybe we've heard of. Uh, on the TV, you may have seen something called SSRIs. That means selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay, let's use, our, let's use our words and see if we can figure out what that means. Reuptake inhibitors, serotonin. Okay, what that means, examples of that are Lexapro, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. They block the reuptake of serotonin. So here's your, neuro, your uh, axon terminal. Here's serotonin. It's being released. It binds its receptor, causes some kind of effect, but it's not, it can't be taken back up. It doesn't go back to the axon terminal. It stays in the synapse a lot longer. The longer it stays in the synapse, the longer it binds those receptors, the more it causes a response, makes you feel better. Okay? So it's not causing you to make more serotonin. That uh, Lexapro, Prozac, Paxil, and Zoloft aren't binding any of your receptors. They're not the drug that makes you feel better. It just changes the way your body processes or uses serotonin, okay? 
MAOIs. Heard of that? That's monamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, Nardil, Marplan, those are some examples of monamine oxidase inhibitors. And sometimes you'll see a, a, a warning if you're taking an MAOI, don't take this drug. Uh, because what it does, it's an enzyme. Monamine, uh, monamine oxidase is an enzyme that breaks down neurotransmitters, just like acetylcholinesterase, okay? If you block this enzyme, if that enzyme can no longer work, then what happens? The neurotransmitters aren't broken down. They stay in the synapse, keep the response going, stays in the synapse longer, makes you feel happy. So here's your axon terminal, here's your organ, that your, your brain, whatever you're trying to uh, make the response. Here's your neurotransmitter, it's released, and instead of getting broken down by an ACE, an, uh, monamine oxidase, that, in, that enzyme doesn't work, the neurotransmitter just stays there, and you feel better. Amphetamines. What are amphetamines? Well, they're psychostimulants, so that means they, you know, kind of rev you up. Examples, Adderall. And basically, it modulates the effects of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Makes them work longer. And they're more effective. And we'll, like I said, we'll see that again when we do the mouse party. It'll kind of, we'll kind of see how that works. Um, cocaine. If you've ever, uh, I'm sure you've heard of cocaine. What it does is it blocks dopamine reuptake, okay? So you're not addicted to cocaine. Cocaine's not doing anything. It's not binding a receptor. It's not making you feel better. What cocaine is doing is blocking the reuptake of dopamine. So dopamine stays in the synapse longer, okay? Binds those receptors and makes you feel good. So that's how it's working. So a lot of times people have the wrong idea about some of these drugs. That, you know, you're taking that drug and it's what's, you know, it's binding the receptors and it's making you feel good and you're addicted to that. What you're addicted to is the way your body responds to cocaine. Does that make sense? A little different than the way most people kind of think of it. And like I said, we'll, we'll do this with the mouse party. Come on, is that it? That may be it. That's the last one? All right. All right. 